Welcome to part five on race and slavery. Now we're going to talk about the South's pro-slavery argument. In the South, slavery was also used as a form of social control to reinforce this idea of white supremacy. And we see this in many cases, like even in the writings of our founding fathers. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, in the only book he ever wrote, Notes on the State of Virginia, talks about slaves and he says, the improvements of the blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites has been observed by everyone and proves that their inferiority is not the effect merely of their condition of life. This unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. So he's saying that you can't <clears throat> emancipate them because they can't survive in our society, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson is a contradiction on all this. He describes slavery like holding a wolf by the ears. You don't want to hold on to it, but you don't dare let him go, right? Now, like I said, though, because most Southerners did not own slaves, only 25% owned any at all, it was going to become necessary to reinforce this idea of white supremacy and social control and create a pro-slavery argument because eventually you're going to have to convince this 75% of the population that they need to be willing to fight and die for this institution of which they reap no benefits. This need to create a pro-slavery argument was bolstered by the fact that the South began feeling more and more like an embattled minority. Um, their population was not growing nearly as fast as the North. For example, in 1790, Southern whites made up 40% of the in total uh, population in the United States. But in 1860, in the eve of the Civil War, that population was only 29% of the whole, which means uh, politically they were losing a lot of power. In the House of Representatives, which is based, representation is based on population, they were only holding 29% of the seats, even with the three-fifths uh, uh, three compromise, right? That means that Northerners held a supermajority, more than two-thirds, a veto-proof uh, majority in the House, right? That makes them feel more and more politically embattled. Now, you couple this with the rise of abolitionism, it gets worse, right? Now, I talked about the uh, creation of an abolitionist society in uh, Philadelphia, but there's others that'll pop up elsewhere. A lot of them actually initially in the South, because remember, like I said, if you're not exposed to it, you don't think about it. But in the South, that 75% that don't own slaves, right, they see the effects of slavery on their society on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them don't like what they see. So you're going to see a lot of abolitionist societies uh, pop up in the South. Now, by 1830, Abolitionism in the South had been so thoroughly suppressed by the pro-slavery argument that it was pretty much gone entirely, right? But you're going to have to go there. See, the South is going to have to choose. They need to make one or two choices as they're moving forward here in American history. They have to either uh, do away with their peculiar institution, get rid of slavery, or they're going to have to find a way to justify it. But who are they justifying it to? Well, they're justifying it to their own people. Like I said, you got that 75% that you've got to convince that the slavery is an important social institution. It's part of the social structure, and therefore that is why, even though you reap no benefit uh, from slavery itself, that is why you must be willing to fight and die for it. We can see this argument develop in the rhetoric in which these guys produced. Duff Green, the editor of the United States Telegraph in November 1835, basically uh, uh, set the stage for this argument I made in the previous slide that they had to uh, convince their own people that slavery was right. He said, we must satisfy the consciousness and we must ally the fear of our own people. We must satisfy them that slavery is of itself right and that it is not a sin against God, that it is not evil, moral or political. To do this, we must discuss the subject of slavery itself. We must examine its bearing upon its moral, political, and religious institutions of the country. In this way, and in this way only, can we prepare our own people to defend our own institutions. See, he's making that argument that, you know, we must justify it to our own people that is morally and socially correct. Uh, John C. Calhoun, you see here second uh, from the left, is going to even challenge the assertions by the Founding Fathers itself. He's going to say the proposition to which I allude has become an axiom in the minds on both sides of the Atlantic that all men are born free and equal. 
taking the proposition literally, there's not a word of truth in it. It begins with, all men are born, which is utterly untrue. Men are not born. Infants are born. And concludes asserting that all they're all born free and equal, which is not less false. They are not born free. They grow to all the freedom of which the condition in which they were born permits. If we trace it back, we shall find the proposition differently expressed in the Declaration of Independence that asserts that all men are created equal. All men are not created According to the Bible, only two, a man and a woman, ever were, and of those, one was pronounced subordinate to the other. All others have come into this world by being born. So he's actually saying Thomas Jefferson is wrong, right? And you see that little dig on women in the middle of that too, right? Uh, George Fitzhugh is going to say that it is necessary to have slavery in a good society. He's going to say agricultural labor is the most arduous, least respectable, and worst paid of all labor. Nature and philosophy teach all who can avoid and escape from it and to pursue less laborious or more respectable, more lucrative employments to do so. None work in the field who can help it. Hence, free society is in great measure dependent for its food and clothing on slave society. So he's justifying we got to have slavery because no, to do the jobs that people don't want to do. That's probably a familiar sounding argument. Finally, we have James Henry Hammond here in an address before the Senate on March 4th of 1858. He gave a famous speech called the Mudsill speech, right? In it, he says, in all society, social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties and to perform the drudgery of life. That is a class requiring but a low order of intellect and but little skill. Its requisites are vigor, docility, and fidelity. Such a class you must have or you would not have the other class, which leads to progress, civilization, and refinement. It constitutes the very mud sill of society and of political government, and you might as well attempt to build a house in the air as to build either one or the other except on this mud sill. Fortunately for the South, she has found a race adaptable for that purpose at her hand, a race inferior to her own but eminently qualified in temper, in vigor, in docility, in capacity to stand to climate to answer all her purposes. We use them for our purposes and we call them slaves. So you see, he's making the argument here in front of the Senate in 1858 that you have to have slave society to build civil society. This is all part of creating the rhetoric of a pro-slavery argument. But the South is not just going to make their argument using rhetoric, right? They're going to take other actions to try and reinforce this pro-slavery uh, uh, position. For example, legislative action. They actually are going to get pushed through in 1836 a gag rule on the floor of the House of Representatives that's going to make it uh, um, against the rules for you to dis give abolitionist speeches on the floor of the House. John Quincy Adams, the former president of the United States, who had returned to the House after, after his presidency, is going to vehemently fight this gag rule and finally give it, get it overturned in 1844, right? Uh, but they'll go further than that, right? In the South itself, they'll restrict speech, right? You're not going to be able to give an abolitionist speech in the South. Abolitionist societies in the South will be dissolved. They'll be forced out of existence, right? Freedom of the press. In the South, the press is going to be very limited on what they can print. You can't print an abolitionist pa pamphlet. You can't even print a statement by a member of Congress or the Senate that is uh, uh, abolitionist in any way, shape, or form. So you're going to restrict freedom of speech and freedom of the press. These are violations, of course, of the Constitution. They're also going to take cultural actions, right, like redesigning school curriculums to reinforce that pro-slavery argument, like with this primer book you see here, right, in which you have this plantation and you can see the slaves picking cotton and the slave master watching over them, right? In 1840, John C. Rutherford at the University of Virginia is actually going to completely revamp the University of Virginia curriculum in order to enhance and reinforce that pro-slavery intellectual culture on the campus.